Okay, um, we're going to be talking about resuscitating a 16-bit DOS open source project that was essentially dead, uh, but there's reasons to keep it alive, so we're going to go into that. Ooh, let's... Okay, so um, the program is, you might have used it already, it's called Fractint, and it's a fractal generator, so first we're just going to briefly talk about what a fractal is. Uh, it was Fractal is a term coined by Benoit Mandelbrot in 1975. He is a researcher at IBM. He published a compendium of his observations in a book called The Fractal Geometry of Nature. It came out in 82. And Mandelbrot recognized that many forms in nature exhibited a kind of self-similarity self -similarity across different scales of magnification. You can think of the coastline of a continent, you know, it has a kind of certain shape to it, and then you zoom in, and it doesn't get more linear, it gets more detail. And uh, the same is true in many other different kinds of uh, shapes that are found in nature. Um, and he discovered that uh, by iterating equations on the, uh, of complex numbers, he could generate images of sets. Mandelbrot's a mathematician, after all. It generating images of sets that had fractal characteristics. So they had the property that as you magnify the set, the same uh, shape would appear in the magnification. It would ha it appear to have infinite detail. And the main such equation that he uh, worked with is now named after him. It, the visualization is, it's the Mandelbrot set. And so you've probably seen this, you know, set around. It's been around since the mid 80s, a long time. Lots of programs generate fractals. So uh, what makes a computer good at fractals is that the basic construction of a fractal is to take a simple recipe and repeat it many, many times. And so computers, they're good at calculation, they're good at repetition, they never get bored, they don't take lunch breaks. So good job for a computer to do. And uh, the challenge though is that fractal images require so much computation that you also need good algorithms. So you need to be smart about how you're doing the work. And the, uh, the other thing that makes fractals interesting is that once you've got a program that can generate the images, there's lots of choices in how you color the images. There's lots of choices in um, what kind of uh, complex equation you're going to be iterating and so on. So there's lots of options to explore to create many different kinds of, of images and that's what kind of makes it fun. If it always just kind of generated the same image, it'd be kind of boring. So um, the program that we're going to be talking about, it, it started as a program called Fract386 written by Bert Tyler and he had a PS2 with no floating point accelerator so most of the fractal programs that were out there used floating point math and they were very slow at generating an image. And when I say slow, it means I'm talking hours to generate like EGA resolution. So long time to wait, which makes it not so fun, right? Well, you, to make it fun, you want to have it be fast so you can play with variations and see what comes out. So he decided that he would rewrite the algorithm using fixed point integer math that was... Uh, you know, the fastest math his machine could do. So he did that and he released a program called Fract386. And in the readme for that program, his idea was, uh, you know, contribution policy, don't want money, got money, want admiration. So this is very much in the spirit of open source. It wasn't uh, a shareware program where you, you know, send $3 and then maybe you get, you know, the diskette, you know, in four weeks or something like that. It was always public domain, freely available code. He always distributed the binary along with the source code. And uh, I couldn't find, um, in my archaeological digging around archive.org, I couldn't find a version 1, but I found version 2.1 that was released in October of 88. And then quickly he released uh, more versions as, uh, you know, he was adding features to the program. So he was, it was proceeding pretty quickly through 88, through 89, and then in version 6.1, he renamed it to FractInt because he added uh, emulation for 8088 machines that didn't have 32-bit math. They had 16-bit math. So he added 32-bit integer math emulation. So it, now it wasn't really a 386-specific program anymore. It was just FractInt. It did fractals using integer math. Um, at a certain point also... Uh, Remember, this is the old days, so like downloading a big zip file over a 1200 baud modem took a long time. So the split, the executable zip and the uh, source file uh, zip into separate distributions. 
uh, you got command line arguments to start specifying uh, options for the rendering because as I say, the part, the interesting part is uh, being able to change all these settings, get different images out. And from version seven onward, it still remained uh, the, under the name Fractint, but that seven uh, forward started being overseen by this guy, uh, Tim Wagner. And then uh, from, so you can see uh, seven is an 89 and eight one is an 89. We got a bunch of releases in 89 and 90. And then things start to slow down a little bit in the early 90s, 91, 92. And then the, the last bunch of releases are, you know, all in the 90s. 19.6 was uh, a release that was widely used by a lot of people. It you know, had tons of features, did lots of different fractal types, lots of different options for how things got colored, color cycling, and so on. Uh, now, I found all this information by digging through archives of zip files with a, a little website called diskmaster.textfiles.com. So if, that's very handy to know if you, you're like, I know the name of this program, but I don't know what zip file it's in, and I don't know where it is on archive.org. So um, that's how I did all this little archaeology to find all these old releases. Um, there still was some development going on after the mid-90s, but things really started slowing down. And honestly, you know, in, into the 2000s, things were just kind of crawling. Little kind of dot patch releases, very small bug fixes, not really new, any new features going on. Essentially, development has stalled. And that's really kind of too bad because Fractint has a lot of strengths. It had built a big community. It had contributions from, uh, I counted 57, but I may have left a few out. So let's just say 60. 60 different offers, 20 major versions over a span of 35 years. It was open source software before we even had the term open source. It had a strong community of, of authors and users. A lot of people were using this program that didn't know anything about how to program. They were just using it to create uh, cool images. Uh, there's at least one book, uh, Fractal Creations by Tim Wagner, that uh, came out uh, that was... Uh, it came out with that 18.21 version in 93. That was the version that was released to go with the book. Uh, there's probably been other books that talk about fractals that mention Fractant or included a copy of Fractant. It was always possible to include Fractant with anything as long as you weren't charging for the program. Uh, one prolific user was this guy, Jim Muth, who started a Fractal of the Day series of images. And from 1997 to 2016, he posted a new fractal image every single day. So that's hundreds and hundreds of images. Um, another good strength of Fractint, a reason to keep it alive, is that it had 200 pages of d documentation and was a DOS program that had its own online help. You can pretty much press F1 anywhere in the DOS program and it will take you to a help screen explaining what you're looking at in terms of the, the program. Uh, but the other interesting thing about the documentation is that it didn't just explain how to use the program. It explained the mathematics of fractal generation itself. So Fractant was unusual in that it didn't just draw fractals for you. It taught you about the mathematics of fractals. So that's another strength. Another strength is the uh, a number of fractal types that this program can generate uh, there was a time where if you wanted to generate a new, uh, a fractal from a new kind of formula, you had to write your own code and then, you know, write your own program and all of that. Um, Fractant added a formula type that basically had, lets you just type the formula into a text file and then Fractant would figure that out and um, would parse that formula and be able to iterate that. But beyond just the complex plane type of fractals that involve iterating a formula, Fractant also had L systems, Lindenmeyer systems. These are a kind of uh, symbolic grammar that lets you uh, write a description of branching structures to be able to model things like plants and bushes, and, and there's a lot of uh, options there. There's one of the few programs that implemented L systems. They also implemented iterated function systems, which is a collection of matrices that specify contractive transformations of the plane. I know this sounds kind of mathy, but that's, there isn't really a simpler way to explain it, but uh, iterated function systems are also a, a different kind of fractal from iterating equations in the complex plane like the Mandelbrot set. 
and it, gi it gives you a way to explore those. Um, there's also other chaotic dynamical systems like the Lorentz attractor. You may have heard about that. It was a, the Lorentz uh, system was a system created to study weather patterns. And as Lorentz started studying the system, he found out that, oh, actually the weather is not predictable. It's chaotic. It, in the, it's chaotic in the sense that if this system, if you start with two different initial conditions and then you run the system forward in time, they end up with different results. Uh, and that is a characteristic of chaotic systems that they are what's called sensitive to initial conditions. Uh, it also has a cellular automata fractal type. That's another, usually the, the cellular automata types are explored in dedicated programs that just did cellular automata. So that's another strength of fractant that it covers all these different fractal types and not just your traditional Mandelbrot set type formulas. So Another strength is the algorithms that were implemented in Fractant. The, there was arbitrary precision math was added to allow for very deep zooming of complex plane fractals. There was periodicity checking added. And this is a speed up technique because as you're iterating these points in the complex plane, you may find that it decay. There's kind of three ways it can go. It can either, um, enter a chaotic orbit where its next position can't be readily predicted. It can escape to infinity, which points are considered out to be outside the set, or it can enter into a period cycle. And if you enter into a period cycle, once you've detected the cycle, you can stop iterating. So that's a speed up technique. And that's a, what they call periodicity checking, periodicity checking. Uh, and then there's a synchronous orbits algorithm that accelerates very deep zooms of the Mandelbrot set. They added random dot stereogram support. You may remember those magic eyes poster. It was kind of a hip thing in the 90s. Um, and then the various different algorithms for scanning the, the complex plane to get an image quickly. So e it may take you a long time to compute every pixel on the screen, but if you can get an approximation on a coarse grid of the screen, then you can see if the image is something you want to stick with or something you want to change parameters, and maybe go to a different kind of image. Um, there was also a uh, 3D support where you can take the fractal and view it as a landscape. The a number of times you're iterating each pixel becomes equivalent to kind of a height on a height field. So they had uh, software rendered 3D support to be able to generate kind of fractal terrains. There was also the ability to, um, as you were iterating points in the complex plane, each iter each uh, set of iterated points is called an orbit. And there was a way to take those orbits and generate sound from them. So it was kind of interesting. Uh, but those were all things that were unique to Fractant. Um, but nothing is impervious. So there were also some weaknesses. And uh, one weakness is that it required... Uh, commercial development environment for 16-bit DOS applications, specifically the last release of uh, Microsoft Visual C++ 1.52, uh, that hasn't been made available commercially for many, many years. Some of the code was written in x86 assembly language, so if you didn't know assembly language, that was going to be a, a barrier to understanding the code. It's also going to be a barrier to porting the code to other architectures because what are you going to do about that assembly language code? Um, it had contributions from many authors. Yes, that was a, a strength from the community, but it was a weakness in the sense that everybody had their own coding style. So when you get in and start looking at the source code, it, you know, it's kind of all over the place. You know, with naming conventions are, are different and, organi you know, it, are we using indent level of three or indent level of eight or four or what have you. It's just so the coding style is kind of inconsistent. Uh, it is a 16-bit DOS program. It never became a 32-bit DOS program. So it goes through amazing amounts of contortions to try to keep everything in that 16-bit memory model uh, using DOS overlays and other kinds of tricks. And there's, there's a lot of memory that gets reused for different purposes that can result in some very interesting bugs. Um, the input model is stuck at got, you know, DOS get a key press type uh, IO or input rather. The output model is um, locked in at uh, the idea of like a VGA memory map frame buffer where every pixel is indexing a color map. And it's stuck in 
256 color mode. So never got true color support. Um, there were some attempts to uh, branch this code off. There was a program called WinFract, which was a fork that was a Windows 3.1 port. Um, the problem is that because it was a divergent code path and it had a different version numbering scheme, it was hard to tell like, well, what version of WinFract corresponds to what version of Fractant? That was always a difficult question to answer. You had to go you know, rummage through some readmes or something to try and figure things out. And because it was a divergent code path, not the primary code path, new features would get added to the DOS version and they'd kind of have to be ported over into WinFract. So while it, WinFract is not a bad effort, there's nothing wrong with WinFract, it, it continued to lag behind and required extra maintenance to keep that in sync. And it was a similar effort for people using uh, workstations you know, universities and whatnot in, in the 90s. It was called x Fractin, and this was a port to the x window system. And it had the same problems. It was a divergent code base. It also had a divergent numbering scheme. And this also brought out some of the x86 assumptions um, that uh, had crept in over time because it was always an x86 program. But there were byte ordering assumptions. There were assumptions about the sizes of certain data types. Uh, when you compile a 16-bit DOS app, the size of an int is two bytes. It's 16-bit. But when you compile it for a 32-bit environment, like Win32, Windows 95, and so on, an int is 32 bits. And so you can't uh, assume that when you write an int into a binary representation that it's going to be two bytes anymore. Uh, those assumptions get bubbled out as you start porting to uh, larger platforms. Um, so how did this program kind of get left behind? Well, it started happening with Windows 9X. It, it, with, you know, Windows 95 was widely adopted. You know, the, in the Windows 3.1 time frame, you probably, you know, lots of people were still just using DOS. You know, they didn't like Windows 3.1. They didn't view it as a big improvement. But Windows 95, that was a different story. So everybody started switching to Windows 95, and Windows 95 essentially runs on top of DOS, so you could still run Fractant, but it started to look dated. It didn't. It started to look like, oh, that's that old DOS program. I remember that. It started being that kind of an impression. When we get to Windows 98, we've got TCP/IP stack included directly, so you don't have to get Trumpet Winsock anymore, and we've got internet access out of the box. And dial-up internet users begin finding other free fractal programs, whether some of them have source code, most of them don't. And uh, but users didn't care. They're like, well, it's free and it works in, you know, it's more like a windowed program. It's easier to use. It's got menus that, you know, off the menu bar and things like that. It's got a save as file dialogue and so on. So they start migrating away, except for the um, proficient fractant users that were using all the fancy features. So... Also, creating fractal images at this point kind of became popular enough that there were even some commercial programs that began to appear. And one by one, these other programs are starting to pull your user base off of this DOS app because your DOS app hasn't been updated and kept up to date with what's going on in computing. In the 90s, things get even worse. You've got GPUs coming onto the scene, so now people are starting to expect you know interactive 3D graphics. They're getting that in their games. They're saying like, hey, how come this DOS thing is still kind of stuck back there? Why can't we get, a, you know, kind of faster GPU accelerated graphics from this program? This program had a, had a reputation for being the fastest fractal generator, and now it's starting to lag behind. Not only that, but the CPUs get a SIMD capability, single instruction, multiple data. So this start, first starts appearing as the MMX instruction extension set, instruction set extension. Uh, but you can then later get um, MMX was integer math, doing multiple integer math operations in a single clock cycle. But as we get to SSE and SSE2, and you know they've continued to add these vector extensions, but SSE was the first one that could do floating point operations. So now we're starting to get to be, you know, the CPU starting to get some ability to do parallel computation. And that's not even counting multi-threading. Uh, and then it gets even worse in the 2000. The GPUs become 
general purpose GPUs. Now it could take my fractal algorithm, run it directly on the GPU, get access to massive amounts of parallelism. Fractals are often one of those so-called embarrassingly parallel pro problems. So it's a perfect fit for GP, GPU computation. You've got CUDA from NVIDIA in 2007. You've got OpenCL from a consortium in 2009. And uh, even before you've got these uh, languages directly letting you program GP, GPU, you've got the ability to kind of shoehorn it into the existing uh, 3D uh, graphics APIs using the shader languages, GLSL for OpenGL or HLSL for DirectX. So Fractant's really starting to look dated now, and it's starting to look dog-ass slow compared to current offerings uh, that are running in these accelerated modes. Now, those programs running in those accelerated modes, they're only doing one or two fractal types. They don't give you all the same options. They certainly don't implement L systems. They don't implement iterative function systems. So there's a lot of features that are unique to Fractant, but because Fractant is starting to look so dated, those features are getting abandoned. Um, there was a mailing list for Fractant. The mailing list traffic has dwindled to like almost nothing, like one or two messages in a six month period. Um, Jim Muth has even given up publishing Fractal of the Day images. He, en he's, he ends his series, a good 10 year run, ends it around 2016. At that point, he wasn't even doing an image a day. It was like maybe a couple images every week or something. And he, he just, you know, no, I, I don't actually know what why he decided to stop. I think it's just time to move on and go do another hobby or something. I, I don't actually know, but that dwindles off and terminates. Um, the community discussion for Fractals is still vibrant, but it's all moved on to web forums, and Fractant never got, they never created a, a web forum that they controlled. Uh, Fractant still gets discussed in web forums, but they're all hosted by other people. So you're at the mercy of someone else for your discussion. That's not, that's not good. You're losing control of your own destiny. And outside developers are no longer contributing. The main team is reduced to two people, Jonathan Osuch and Tim Wagner. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with those guys. They, they are, are certainly capable. They've added a lot of features to Fractant over the years. But even those guys get burnt out, and they're not making regular contributions contributions to the source code anymore. All the fractal artists, the people who are more interested in the end result image than they are in programming, and they're not even strictly interested in the mathematics necessarily, they, maybe they're just, they're just interested in the end result as an artistic expression. Those people have all moved on to other programs that are more capable and have more features, especially true color support. This being stuck on the 256 um, colors per pixel uh, color model is really holding things back. So um, what are we going to do about this? Well, I had made some contributions to Xfractant. Uh, I worked at the time at a, a company that had Unix workstations. And so, you know, I wanted it to run better on my workstation. So I, I made some small improvements. And I wanted to explore more L system algorithms. I wanted to do fancier plant models that could give you actually, th you know, more realistic 3D plant renditions from these models, which is possible. Researchers had done it. There's a researcher called uh, Premislav Prusinkevich who's done a lot of research up in Canada. And he, his work was all published in a book called The Algorithmic Beauty of Plants. Great book, beautiful pictures. No reason that Fractant's L system feature couldn't be extended to get the same results as he showed in his book. But the code has to be enhanced. And uh, I didn't want to write a program from scratch. I, you know, it's easier to modify existing code to enhance it than it is to uh, write a program from scratch. At least that's what I thought at the time. So uh, I started familiarize, familiarizing myself with the code base and I proposed a driver abstraction to separate the UI from the computation because really it was the UI that was uh, attaching all this code to DOS. I mean. Iterating, you know, complex plane equations, that's just computation. You can do that in any platform. But it's the user interface that was really connected most tightly to DOS. So I wanted to introduce an abstraction in there to separate things so that we could move forward with a, a new modern Windows-oriented uh, user interface. And I start working on this as a branch from the 20.04 version. 
and I produced a uh, what I was calling version 21 beta uh, in, in around this time, and I got up to beta 5 around 2007. And, uh, oh man, so painful, so painful. Uh, so working on this code, uh, it, it just had, as I mentioned before, all these different coding styles. It had, you know, 30 years of technical debt accumulating in there. There's a divergence between the assembly implementation of some code and the C implementation of the code. The C implementation is supposed to be portable. That's what the Unix code was using, extract in. Um, but you find out that there's just subtle differences and, and even bugs, of course, you know, because it's two divergent code paths. And whenever you have two of something, you don't have a single source of truth. And there was also, as I mentioned, these data type assumptions. And there was a lot of contortions in the code to fit into the 16-bit DOS medium memory model. Uh, and, oh my gosh, hundreds of global variables. And the reason global variables are bad is not because that they're visibly at a global level, but the problem is that the communication between different parts of code ends up being very indirect. You know, code A scribbles some stuff into some memory over here, and then code B over here go grabs it out and does something with it. So it's hard to see exactly how the different co pieces of code are connected together. And that's indirect coupling is what they call it in software engineering. There's also no automated tests at all on this other than render the image in the old code, render the image in the new code, and kind of look at them with your eyeballs and see if they're the same, or maybe do some kind of image compare. Um, so it's difficult to know and when you're changing the code. It's difficult to know if you're actually breaking anything. So this leads me to um, the idea like, well, what we need to do is refactor this code to kind of clean it up. We don't want to change the behavior. We just want to change the structure of the code to make it easier to understand. That's what's called refactoring. And so I start writing up some of these refactorings that I was doing over and over again. And I'm like, hey, I'm probably not the only person that's going to run into this kind of situation. So let's write up these recipes for other people to reference if they're going to run into the same problem. So this is around the 07, 09 time frame. I start writing up these refactorings that I'm doing on the code. And as I'm going through this, I'm just like, you know what? It's just too painful to try to keep this code compiling in DOS. Let's just ditch DOS and move forward, right? No, nobody's really using DOS at this point anymore. It's, it's the mid 2000s. You know, people have gotten used to the idea of GPUs. They're on Windows. This, you know, the DOS user base is essentially minuscule. Now, certainly hobbyists, vintage computing enthusiasts, even then, we're around using DOS, but you know what? Those old versions of Fractant run just fine on DOS. There's nothing wrong with keeping those old releases around for DOS as we take the code and move it forward. So my, that was my idea was like, let's just ditch the DOS stuff going forward. It doesn't mean we won't have executables and versions of the source code that run on DOS, but we're going to move everything to a flat memory model. We're going to get rid of you know, the DOS restrictions. We're going to separate the UI computation uh, from computation using this, you know, what I called a driver API. We're going to start using OpenGL for graphics uh, because it's it's reasonable to assume accelerated OpenGL at that point. And at some point, we're going to have to migrate the uh, what's called the flow of control. You know, in a DOS program, you've got something that's like, did you press a key? Oh, not yet. Okay, keep going. Did you press a key? Oh, not yet. Okay, keep going. Did you press a key? Oh, wait, you did. So now let me go pop up a menu. And that's basically a device polling as opposed to a, a program for a Windows-oriented framework. And when I say Windows here, I'm not just talking Microsoft Windows, but also the X Windows system or the Amiga or, you know, even the Atari ST. Anything that is event-driven, it's a different kind of... Uh, structure to your program, the different flow of control, because you've got basically a main event loop that's waiting for events from the operating system or the windowing system. And when you get an event, you respond to it. And if you don't have any events uh, available, then you can go do some background work like computing the fractal, doing the computation. So that was my view, was let's do that. Let's modernize things and go forward. And the existing team, they're like, well, we don't want to do that. And I was like, well, let's talk about it. So we talk about it for a while and we end up with them saying, we don't want to do that. And I said, okay, 
Um, but this is open source, so I'm just going to fork the code and I'm just going to go off. And that's what I decided to do. This is around 2014. I don't want my fork to be confused with Fractant. Fractant has a long, you know, proud history. I don't want people to think I'm Fractant because I'm not. Uh, so I call my fork Iterated Dynamics because it's really the essence of what fractal computation is about. Some dynamical system, you're iterating it, the iterations are giving you information that you're using to create an image. Um, and I didn't want any confusion between what I was doing and Fractant. So I start work on that. Uh, and then at a certain point, I'm like, oh yeah, working in C, I remember why this is so painful and I stopped doing it around like 1993. So I start converting all the code to C++ because I can get better type checking. I can get the compiler helping me to find my bugs. And I convert all the code over to C++. It also gives me room to have better abstractions going forward. I can start using more libraries. I can start using, um, you know, uh, object-oriented frameworks for my GUI layer and things like that. And I convert everything over to C++. And, okay, I just want to make sure it was animating for you. Uh, I, I start removing all this technical debt, and this is, you know, as I said, this is refactoring where you're changing the code, but your problem is, is you start changing something, and then you're like, yeah, this is going really good. And you start making more and more changes, more and more changes, and then you go, you know, you haven't tested the code for like a month or something. You go to run it, and everything's broken, and you're like, crap. I don't know which of the thousands of changes that I've been making is responsible for this mistake. So you kind of got to back up and, and, and figure out how to go forward. So I figured there's got to be a better way. It turns out that this company introduces a fancy tool for automated refactoring. So now manual refactoring, that's where the mistakes come from, right? If I've got automated refactoring, then I can trust the tool to do the right thing. I can make the changes with a low likelihood of making a mistake. I'm like, this is perfect. Let, let's go and do that. So then we get on our first major side quest here. Uh, I start using this tool and I start noticing, hey, uh, some of the code that it produces actually doesn't even compile. This isn't good. And I go talk to the vendor and they're like, no, no, our tool is awesome. We have thousands of automated tests and they all pass. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, are you actually using your tool on real code? Because it's breaking all the time for me. And they're like, no, 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 we, no, it's, it's awesome, man. So I created a test suite for refactoring tools. And then I start filing bugs on their tool. And I filed hundreds of bugs. And about bug 100 in, they're like, um okay, yeah, we got some problems. And I'm like, good, 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 good. Let's get those fixed and like, you know, because your tool is actually really good except for the places where it messes up. So let's just improve the quality and things are going to be awesome. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're working on it. And then about four years later, they're like, uh, sorry, it's too hard, we give up. And they withdraw their tool from the marketplace. So I'm like, well, oh, crap, we're stuck. But are we? Uh, along this time, I'm like, you know, I've been doing this refactoring thing, but I also need, I need this code. It's just too crazy. The only way for me to get a handle on this Hydra, this big, you know, bag of worms that I'm dumping my hand into, I've got to get some automated tests on this code. And then if I can get the current behavior controlled by a test, then if I change the structure of the code, but I want to keep the same behavior, I can run the test. And if the test still passes, then I know I didn't break any behavior. So I read this book. It's an awesome book, uh, Working Effectively with Legacy Code by Michael Feathers. It explains how to get legacy code under test. I started like, like okay, uh, we're going to be end up writing a lot of tests. So we, let's use a test framework. And the Boost or, uh, is, is an organization and a collection of libraries that provides peer-reviewed portable C++ source libraries. They have a testing framework called Boost.test. And I'm like, let's try that. And then we end up on our second major side quest that it turns out the documentation for this test framework, I can eventually figure it all out, but it, and I can easily see a newcomer's like, you know, how does this stuff even work? This is very confusing. 
So I end up uh, doing, I, I, again, talk to the author of the library. I'm like, you know, your documentation is very confusing. He's like, I don't understand it. It makes perfect sense to me. And I'm like, of course it does. You wrote it. Of course it makes sense to you. It doesn't make sense to anybody else though. He doesn't believe me. So I say, all right, let's go just, we'll just, it's open source. We can just rewrite the documentation and I can just basically contribute the documentation rewrite. Uh, I do that and I end up using my rewritten documentation for a tutorial on test-driven development that I presented at C++ Now 2014. I take my rewrite, I submit it to the author of the library. He agrees that what I've done has provided better organization for all the features in the test framework and that, you know, everything, you know, kind of proceeds linearly. Now we can start at the beginning of the documentation, get the simple stuff under our belt, read more into the documentation and get the more complicated features under control into our understanding. So he takes my documentation rewrite. He doesn't literally just dump it in, but he, he uses it to essentially rewrite the documentation in his own way and incorporates the, the major bug fixes that, you know, that I, which is essentially changing the, the organization of the documentation. So he takes that on and I'm like, great. Um, but along the way, I realized, you know, for where I want to go with this program, we're not going to be able to homebrew everything inside this code. Uh, Fractant had a, that, that arbitrary precision math library. It wasn't using GNU MP, GNU multiple precision. It was, had its own homebrew uh, arbitrary precision math library that has its own, all its own set of weirdness that uh, the author clearly understands, but it's difficult for other people to understand. So if we want to get other authors contributing to the source code again, we're going to have to get onto standard libraries and, st and stop using these weird bespoke things that while they are awesome achievements, they are weird and they are bespoke. So they're, they're not readily accessible to other people. So we're going to need other libraries. But I don't know these libraries yet. And the best way to learn a library is to teach it to somebody else. So I start up a, a meetup that meets once a month uh, called Utah C++ Programmers. Uh, and ever since lockdown, we've been doing the meetings virtually and they get the videos get uploaded to YouTube. So if you're interested in seeing what I've been talking about library wise for like the past two or three years, those are all on YouTube. The channel is Utah CPP programmers. Uh, so great, start doing that. And also along the way, when we, when we gave up on that other refactoring tool that was, you know, just kind of sheepishly put its tail between its legs and removed itself from the marketplace, I found out that the guys creating the Clang compiler, they were creating refactoring tools that they called, it was initially called Clang Modernize, and then they changed it to Clang Tidy because it tidies up your code. And because Clang Tidy works using the Clang compiler, it parses your source code perfectly every time. So you're never having the problem where your refactoring tool can't understand your code in order to make changes to it. So it always parses your code correctly and you can, it can either flag suspicious constructs with a warning, and in a better sense, it may be able to suggest a replacement for the thing that you've done. Like, you did it this way, and that technically works, but here's a better way to do it. So it can suggest ways to improve your code, and those suggestions can be applied automatically. So I'm like, well, this, this, sounds, this sounds pretty cool. Let, let's take a look at this. Uh, so I start making some contributions to Clang Tidy. I presented a talk on how to do this at the C++ Now 2014. That, that talk's out on uh, YouTube. You can find it. And so over a period of years, and you can see the most recent one I did was, you know, 2022, replacing a macro with an enum. Um, so these are just things that, you know, they, they improve your code, but most of all, these improvements can be applied automatically and they won't introduce errors. Uh, so that was one major side quest. And then I start realizing you know, do, I mean, if I'm going to write these tests and apply it to this old code, I'm going to have to get some practice at that because modifying legacy code is probably the hardest thing you can do as somebody that writes code. Because first of all, you didn't write it. Somebody else wrote it. They're not around to explain it to you. If you're lucky, they put some comments in there that explained it. 
if you're unlucky, they put some comments in there that explained it that are now out of date and actually don't explain anything, but it makes you think they're explaining things. And so you get lost in a bad explanation until you reverse engineer the code yourself and you're like, this comment does not describe what this code does. This comment describes something else that it used to do. So we're going to need some practice doing this stuff. And it, it turns out that I've been working at places that do C++ and uh, that gives me a chance to do a test-driven development on the regular. So we always try to write a failing test before we make any change, whether it's a bug fix or adding a feature, we write a failing test that says what it should do, but doesn't do yet. We go change the code to make the test pass. And when the test passes, that's how we know we fixed the bug or it's how we know that the feature is complete. Uh, and I start using um, C test, which is, uh, it's not a test framework per se, it's just a way to run your tests, but it integrates with the CMake um, uh, build system. So we start, I start using C test to run the tests. And I also figure out, um, well, I mean, I didn't, it's not an original idea, but I mean, it's just to figure out the mechanism of how I'm going to do image compare tests. Because what I want to do is generate fractal images for all these different fractal types in the old DOS code. And then I want to run my code, generate the same image for the same fractal type, compare the two images and make sure they're, they're the same, right? That's how we know we didn't break it. And then using all these libraries, you know, it's just a big pain in the butt. You got to go download the source code, compile it yourself, figure out how to build it. They all have different weird build systems, figure out how to build it figure out how you're going to take your code and link it all together. And you know, you just, you're looking at those JavaScript guys that are just like, Oh, it's just NPM install foo and we're good to go. And the Python guys, they're like, Oh, it's just pip install, blah, blah, blah. And we're good to go. And you're just like, man, I wish I had something like that. And then these package managers start appearing on the scene. Uh, I tried one out. Uh, the, the first one thing that I tried was Conan. It was very Unix centric and I'm primarily developing on Windows and it just fell on its face when I tried to use it for Windows. And so I talked to the Conan guys and they're like, oh, well, we all develop on Linux. We don't really care about Windows. I'm like, dude, you got to care about Windows. There's so many people out there. You can't just leave us behind. Windows is the harder one. You do the harder one first so that the Linux port is easy. And they're like, yeah, well, we'll get around to it. I'm like, I, that, that, that's not good enough. But then this other package manager called VC package appears and it's from Microsoft. And I'm like, eh, is this going to be the opposite problem? It's going to work on windows and it's just going to fall flat on Linux. But honestly, Microsoft is a different company. Now the people working at Microsoft, there's a lot of people in there that are passionate about cross-platform open source. And especially the Visual Studio guys, they're not Windows focused anymore in the sense that they're like, we want the best development environment on any platform for any developer. And I'm like, well, that's a really different kind of approach to things. So I take a look at VC Package. Turns out works great on Windows and on Linux. I, I tried it on both, everything was fine. Um, it integrated well with CMake and I start practicing using that with uh, all the libraries that I'm showing with Utah C++ programmers. So then we get into building, testing, and packaging. I'm going to speed up a little bit here because we're getting to the end of the time. So long story short, I had used Visual Studio specific things for the beta 5 that I had produced for Fractint 21, but now for iterated dynamics, we got to be cross-platform. So I switched to using CMake for building, CTest for testing, and CPack to create the packages. Now, I've done all these side quests. I'm, I'm ready to go back and slay the beast. So, um, just roughly, yeah, I was doing all, a bunch of commits over time, but I really tackled into it this year and, and finished the final push. So, from February to uh, just a couple of days ago was the last commit. I, you know, about 2,400 commits that were, you know, fixing bugs, but also just modernizing things. Like I went through the whole, um, you know, I got my release pan updated. I figured out what bugs were going to be showstoppers. that had to be fixed in 1.0, got all of those fixed. I added automated tests for my big code changes and I have reference image tests that I'm comparing against the old fractant renderings to make sure that I'm not breaking any of those fractal types, um, which saved me more than once. 
And the big ticket item, really, what, what was unexpected, but it's that 200 pages of documentation that comes with the program. I had to go through every single line of all those help files and make sure that they stop talking about like, if you have the wrong VGA card, it's not going to work like, you know, you got to drop all that DOS stuff. But also there was a little bit of um, new text that was added, you know, some more background on certain fractal types. They had kind of skimmed over the background of the, uh, the L systems. So I added the documentation for that. And the big item was that I got this help compiler, which is specific to this, you know, uh, program for their online help. Got that to output ASCII doc format so we could get really nice HTML help for online and it ships with the applications. It's not quite integrated yet, but, um, so the integrated help is still the DOS system, you know, text screens 80 by 25, but we've got an HTML help that looks decent. And one of the original contributors to Fractin joined me along the way as I, I started finishing off this 1.0 release. He, it turns out he had frack, uh, forked WinFract a while ago to create a program he calls ManPWin. And he'd implemented many additional fractal types, found in other programs, and uh, implemented an algorithm called perturbation methods that helps accelerate very, very deep zooms. And he also had implemented uh, true color output in his program. So he and I have been collaborating and it's a team effort again. And that's really helped keep my motivation up to finish off this 1.0 release. Um, and in there, Paul created a formula file uh, to implement the burning ship fractal type, which is a very popular fractal type these days. And um, it also serve, served as valuable, valuable sounding board for me to um, ping back and forth over email, having discussions about, you know, we should do this first or should we do that first? You know, how do we get this and what should be, you know, should, is this important enough to be in 1.0 or can we push it off to 1.1? Um, and that's been extremely valuable. So short term, uh, we got a 1.1 release, uh, 1, 1 1.0 released earlier this week. Uh, you can get that from GitHub. Uh, it's, there's a compiled version as well as source code. But 1.1 we've got planned uh, for the short term time frame, maybe by the end of the year. Uh, now that we've got this HTML help format, we can get you know uh, images into the help for the first time. So you can have screenshots and we can have images of the various fractals that are generated. So you can kind of get an idea of what the fractal looks like before you spend time generating one. We're, uh, Paul's been working on uh, integrating the perturbation methods for accelerating deep zooms. Uh, we might get that into 1.1. Uh, currently, the mouse and sound support has been disabled. Uh, I'd like to get the mouse and sound support re-enabled back for 1.1. i got to find a good audio library for the sound stuff. I haven't found that yet. And then uh, version 2, we're going to switch to Wix Widget's portable GUI framework and start replacing all these DOS screens with uh, actual... Di you know, modern dialogues and, you know, probably get true color output. You know, either, we either get true color output in 1.1, Paul might contribute that, or uh, we'll certainly get it uh, probably by, by 2.0. Um, for the wish list, you know, just longer term, we're going to steal as much as we can from other open source fractal programs. You know, nothing wrong with that. Uh, we're going to get true color output. Uh, we'll have perturbation methods. We're also going to get uh, SIMD parallel computation for accelerated CPU rendering. We'll get GPGPU computation for GPU accelerated rendering. And the GPU accelerated rendering is going to be a huge performance boost. Um, I've got some plans for how to do just-in-time compilation of the formula types into machine code for your, you know, whatever platform you're running on. So it'll work for ARM, it'll work for x86, it'll work for, well, IRIX if you can get it compiling over there. Um, and we're going to, you know, start getting a true 3D output with OpenGL. And uh, now that I've done all this janitorial work, now we can get onto the fun stuff, right? We can start you know, implementing new features and start having some fun. Um, if you want to get the stuff, you can go to, uh, and by the way, these slides will all end up on the VCF Midwest website later. Uh, so you don't need to worry about, uh, you know, memorizing these URLs, but you can get our current release off of GitHub 
And I did all that archaeology to figure out where all those old fractant releases were. So if you want to run fractant on your older machine, uh, I have a, a GitHub repository, Fractant Legacy, where the releases there are all the, you can go all the way back to the original Bert Tyler's Fract 386 2.1 release or any of the subsequent other releases that I could find out on archive.org. So I've collected those all in one place. Uh, you can find those if you want to run those. Now, uh, I can run the program. So let's get out of that. And just to show you what it looks like. And I'm going to have to do this. And I'm going to go hands-on with the mic so I can go over here. So one of the interesting things about Fractant is I said that it had this strength in a huge community. And the intro screen is the credit screen. And you can see all those 57 people that contributed scrolling by. Now we can get into a video mode. And if this looks like a DOS program, that's because it is a ported DOS program, right? The video modes really are just describing the size of your image. So here we've got your standard Mandelbrot set, but if you press T, we can see all the other different types of fractal types we can generate. We can go over here to Lorenz 3D. Lorenz 3D has some per specific parameters. And if I press F1 in here, we get into the little help system. It's explaining the Lorenz attractor and the mathematics behind it, how that works. We can escape to get back out to the parameter screen. We can select these default, accept these default parameters. And that's kind of an, you know, ugly image, but it is the Lorenz attractor. We can go back over here to another type. Uh, let's go to gingerbread man, take the default parameters, and there's gingerbread man fractal. So as far as I know, all the types work. Uh, I'm not saying there aren't any bugs. There are. But it's working pretty well. We can escape back out to the main menu. If we do escape once more, we exit the program. And uh, maybe some of you guys will find this cool enough. You want to join the team and contribute to the code. Uh, we got time for some questions, I think. If anyone has any questions, please come up to the Q&A mic, if, that, if possible. I'm just curious, so you've talked about GPU acceleration. How do you handle the arbitrary precision arithmetic for deep zooms on the GPU? Uh, there is an arbitrary precision math library that uh, can work on the GPU. Uh, the GPU instruction set, at least for CUDA, does have the ability to recognize the carry bit so you can recognize when you need to keep performing more math operations. Um, I think the arbitrary math support is going to be the biggest challenge of getting all of the features GPU accelerated. But o uh, only a few of the fractal types in the DOS code are arbitrary precision enabled. The Mandelbrot set and uh, the Julius set and a couple others have deep zoom capability, but the rest of them are just operating on floats and doubles. Just one other. How did you decide between Wix widgets and Qt? So I've used Qt and Wix widgets both uh, in my you know daytime job type situation. The reason that I chose Wix widgets because uh, Wix widgets philosophy is that it's the smallest wrapper around the operating system's native GUI framework. So it results in smaller code and um, the look and feel is just more straight on and, and in terms of you know, how it appears to users on those platforms. Qt on the other hand implements the entire uh, look and feel itself, it re-implements the entire look and feel itself. So the weird thing is a Qt application, if you give it the right command line arguments, you can make it look like a Mac application on Windows. It's, it's kind of goofy, and I'm sure there's some people that like that, but I just always thought that was, you know, it's just overkill. On the other hand, implementing that complete look, of feel, look and feel is really good for an embedded environment where you don't have a native GUI you know, operating system, so like a kiosk type application. But 
I, this is, I, that, that's why I just chose Wix widgets. It's just my preference, but I know QT is very popular, but it's kind of bloaty to be honest. Yeah. So I was thinking like, how do you maintain focus and dedication to the project, especially one that spans as long as this one did? So, um, honestly, if you, if I, if we go back and see my slides where I had like, you, there's clearly bursts of activity and then like I you know don't do anything for like a year or two and that's basically because it's hard to stay motivated when you're the only person that seems to care the original team they're like we don't want to do that and I'm like okay well they're so they're not contributing and they're they, they're not even supporting me in my efforts to go this way because they disagreed and which is fine that's perfect their perfect right to go do that the main thing that helped kept me motivated to finish off 1.0, and actually I gave myself the date of this conference as my target release date so to make sure I'd have it done, it's collaborating with Paul. Uh, and Paul and I experienced, uh, had, had a bunch of the same experiences in, you know, in terms of like, why did we make a fork of the code and go our own different direction? It's because like we wanted to do things and the, the, uh, the other team members didn't want to do that, so we went off on our own. So staying uh, focused and staying motivated. Uh, the, the, there's two ways that I've uh, done that in, you know, on this project. One is you just say like, you know what? Today, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mop up this particular kind of mess. So I'm just gonna go through all of the code and I'm gonna remove all the far pointer decorations. You know, everything's gonna stop being a far pointer and it's just gonna be a pointer. So this involves going through all the code and basically deleting the word far everywhere that it appears. And that's something you just be like, all right, you know, I got, there's like 8,000 instances according to my little grep through the code. So we're going to do a hundred every day until we're done. You know, so that way is just kind of, uh, that's just the old uh, karate kid wax on wax off. You're just practicing. You're just be like, it's just brainless. And it feels like I'm not doing anything important, but you are you're cleaning up messes and eventually it gets to where like that whole mess isn't completely gone. And now when you look at the source code, you're like, you're reading it and you're those, it, that, that one irritant is gone. So it makes your life a little bit better. And the, the other way to stay motivated uh, is to get somebody that you can discuss this work with in an ongoing way where they can be encouraging, you know, like Paul, he's got his own code that he's working on and I, we would be talking about um, various bugs and he's like, oh yeah, my program has that same bug. And I was like, well, I found it over here in this file and I fixed it and he would go, cause his fork and my fork are from the same original code base. He'd go off and finding, you look in his code and he's like, oh yeah, I had that same bug. Now I fixed it, that's so cool. So we'd keep each other motivated. Um, but even if it's somebody that's not directly working on the project, just somebody that you can discuss things with and they can be like, you know, yeah, I think you should keep going. You know, just, just having somebody to discuss it with, I think helps keep you motivated because it feels less like you're a prisoner in a box. Awesome, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm getting the sign to wrap this up. So any other, one more question. If you want to talk to me in detail about it, I'm over, I have a table over at E16 Beehive Bit Bunker. Come see some gamma ray spectroscopy gear from the 60s and talk about fractals. Thanks.